God has a message for you today. That's what we believe. That's why we come here. We give priority to his word, and that's what we do here at Calvary Chapel Syracuse. Well, if you have your bulletin, we'd love to uh, go through a couple of announcements with you. If you look on the right-hand side, it's going to give you this week at Calvary Syracuse. Those are all of our normal activities. A little bass going there. Those are all of our normal activities. After that, it gives some uh, special announcements. We have the Art of Marriage Seminar. That is going to be Friday night, this Friday night coming up, and Saturday morning through afternoon. We have a few couples that are signed up for this. We're going to have a great time here. If you hadn't signed up, if somehow you missed all the announcements and you want to get in under the wire, see me or see Lynn Lizzie. Lynn's in the back. See me or Lynn today. Okay, make sure that it's today. And we may be able to help you. All right. Uh, far as we have a women's conference at Northside Church. That's going to be Cultivate. It's called a Women's Gathering Around the World. The speaker is Kelly Minter. It has the information there about the dates the time, and the cost. Lucy Lang is coordinating that, so if you want to go to that, ladies, you see Miss Lucy, and she will take care of you. Operation Christmas Child, I won't say anything about that because we'll have a little video announcement after this. On October 28th, from 6 to 8, we're going to be having a movie showing of Woodlawn, a great movie that we've seen here before. If you want to come out to that, we do encourage you to do so. Also, please have your friends come. You see, we got some signs outside on the lawn saying, come out to this movie. It's free. You get to eat popcorn in the sanctuary. That never happens. So if you want to be here for that, please do so and invite a friend. October 28th from 6 to 8. Uh, we have Compassion Christmas Letter Time. That's going to be October 22nd and 29th. Up in the coffee house, we'll have all the things that you need to write a letter to your compassion child if you're sponsoring a child. Paper, pen, envelopes, postage, the whole deal. So all you have to do is come in and write to your child. A great thing for them to get right around Christmas time. Grief Share presents Surviving the Holidays. That's going to be on November 12th at 6.30. This is a special one-time edition of Grief Share that helps people deal with uh, the loss of a loved one during a holiday. I personally lost a sister right before Thanksgiving, so Thanksgiving is always a little bittersweet. So it's, it's just a little something to work through getting through the holidays if you're dealing with grief and the loss of a loved one. You don't have to go to this church to come. You don't have to be a Christian to come. Invite your friends out if, if, it's, if you know that this affects them, and this would be a great time for them to be here at Calvary. So that's, again, November 12th at 6.30. I'm going to step aside, and we have a short video on Operation Christmas Child. It's happening now. Not just across the world, but here, in your backyard. You have a voice. You have a call. Go and make disciples of all nations. It's not hard. It's easy. You have a family, you have a community, and they want to know, how do we do this? When do we do this? Why do we do this? Tell them, your message doesn't stop in your cities and homes. It travels through the hands of the people who hear it, through shoeboxes that are packed with simple gifts and delivered to local churches around the world so that children can hear about Jesus. You joining us is the body of Christ coming together in unity to share the gospel, not just with a few, with millions. This is what a shoebox does. Believers understand that this is a powerful tool that the church uses for evangelism and discipleship. It multiplies beyond the children who receive these gifts. You have a voice from families to communities to churches. We are the body of Christ, sending the gospel to the far ends of the earth. Are you in? We're in. 
<laughs> we do Operation Christmas Child every year. It's an amazing ministry. The stories of children who get a box that has exactly what they need is just amazing. It's mind-blowing what God has done through this ministry. Out in the entryway, there's a tree. Pull off a tag. You see what's on it. You get those things for Operation Christmas Child. Bring them in. All the information about Christmas Child is in the bulletin. It tells you when we'll be packing and what the deadline date is as well. Be a part of this. It will really bless you. We hope you do join us in that. On a personal note, I really want to thank everyone who has called, prayed, made meals, sent cards, sent gifts. I really, really appreciate it. I, I said at first service I would talk more about it, but then I would have a Pastor Ken moment up here. I'd start crying. And Pastor Ken's really good. He starts crying. He stops. He keeps talking. I just cry. I just cry. So thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> You could make me cry, Walt. All right. <laughs> but we're just going to open in prayer, and then we're going to get into the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that it's yea and amen, and that it's true for our lives today. We pray, thank you, Lord, that your word is timeless, and that we would, as we look into it today, that we would find truth for our lives today. We pray, Lord, that you would show us yourself in your word, show us ourselves, show us our Savior. And by your spirit, Lord, we pray that your word would be real in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've been in Nehemiah, and it's been a little while, I know. But we're in chapter 8 this morning. And Nehemiah has come from Persia. If you recall, Nehemiah has been, uh, he was the cupbearer to the king, the king of Persia, who at this time is the most powerful man on earth, the Persian kingdom is the largest kingdom the world had ever seen at the time. He leaves that position, and he comes to this broken-down little place, Jerusalem, which has had its walls broken down for over 140 years. He's going to rebuild the walls because God has put it in his heart to do so. He comes, he unites the people, he works with them, and the people, the Bible says, the Bible says the people had a mind to work. And they do so, and they rebuild the wall within 52 days. 52 days, they gather together, marshal their resources, and they build the wall. Despite all kinds of opposition, the Bible tells at one point that their enemies are coming from every direction, north, south, east, and west, around the wall, and they still get it done because God was with them. God was with them, and this was something that could not have occurred unless God did it. And so within 52 days, the walls are rebuilt. And so the work on the walls has been done, but there is work that needs to be done on the people as well. As we get to chapter 8, we're going to see what's going on here. So if you would read along with me, we have Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. So this is public square, middle of the city, the water gate is right there. Everyone can gather there. If you go back to the end of chapter 7, you'll see that we're talking about about 50,000 people that are gathering together for this moment. So they're all crammed in. There's no microphones. There's no air conditioning. There are no comfy seats. They all cram in 50,000 people because they're expecting to hear from God's word. We get to verse 2, it says, they told, actually verse 1, so they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. They told Ezra, the priest, the scribe, they want to hear God's word. They had an expectation that when he brought the word of God, that it was going to speak to them. That was what they wanted. They wanted to hear God's word. I find it interesting that, you know, it's so easy for me personally to, to neglect God's word. I have to consciously make the effort to get into God's word on a daily basis. If I don't, it won't happen. Why is that? I'm thinking perhaps, maybe, it's because it's so readily available to us. I have an app on my phone that's got my Bible, my actual physical Bible 
is up in my office on the desk, and I leave it there because I've got the Bible on my phone. I can get it at any time. I read just this week about a, a, a place in Africa, I forgot the name of it, but they only have the Bible translated into the New Testament and the book of Psalms, which means if they wanted to read the book of Nehemiah, they couldn't. What we're doing here this morning, they can't even do. We take for granted what we have all the time. These folks didn't have the Bible in hand. They didn't have a scroll that they could pull out in the, in the family room or anything like that. They had to come to hear God's word, and that's what they're going to do. They come to hear God's word, and they come with expectance. They come expectantly because they believe that what God's word has to say is for them. And you know it's the truth because of when they come. The Bible's going to tell us that they came, and they came early in the morning, and that they stayed until midday. That's something we plan to institute, by the way, so please be prepared for that. But they came from early morning until midday. Let's read on. Ezra, verse 2, Ezra the priest brought out the book of the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and all who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. A couple of things. First, it says that the people gathered as one man into the square. What does that mean? It means they gathered with a singular purpose. They wanted to hear God's word. They did not, they set aside all of their differences. I assure you that these 50,000 people did not agree on everything in life. Just like the people in this room don't agree on every single thing. Me and my wife don't agree on every single thing. <laughs> we all have differences. If we are thinking for ourselves, we're all going to come to different conclusions about things. But they gathered as one man. Think about it. What divides us today? Democrat, Republican, black, white, woman, men, losing Red Sox fans and happy Yankee fans. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist that one. <laughs> but they all gathered as one man with one purpose. And the point of that, in my mind when I read this, is that it didn't matter. The differences were less than what united them. What united them was the word of God. They wanted to hear God's word. If you remember back in chapter 4, when the people got together, it gives this huge list of all these names of people who worked on the wall. And you had professional people, you had lay people. You had men and you had women. You had perfumers and you had politicians. You had all people from all walks of life and they all gathered for the one purpose of working on the wall. And it makes me think of our church and every local church that's around, that we gather together as one person for the cause of Christ. If we didn't go to this church together, would we know each other? Probably not. If we didn't have, go to the same workplace or maybe live in the same area, we would not know each other. We know each other because we come together for a common cause, and it's the cause of Christ. And it's greater than any of our differences. And we need to recognize the fact that no difference that we have, if we have some theological differences, if you think it's a pre-trib rapture or a post-trib rapture, if you think women should cover their heads or you think their heads should be open, if you have any of these differences, we can still worship together because we believe in Jesus. The cause of Christ is greater than any of our differences. And the people gather together as one man. That's the first thing. Also, these people want to hear from God. They have an expectant heart. They are expecting that when God's word is opened, that it will be speaking to them. That's what they want. They want God's word to speak to them. They don't want to hear a mere man sitting up here giving his opinion. They don't want to hear the latest philosophy. They want to hear God's word. 
That's their expectance. That's what they want. They're expecting to hear God speak to them through his word. They said, Ezra, bring the book of the law of Moses and read it to us. This is what they want. You know, last week, last week Sunday, I was, at, I was in Philadelphia at an Eagles game. Philadelphia Eagles are, are playing the Arizona Cardinals. We went to this game because the family is divided. We have Eagles fans, we have Cardinals fans. So we looked on the schedule and said, great, this is a game we can go to. So we get there, we get to our seats, and the Eagles absolutely kill the Cardinals. It's not even close. It was terrible. It was just a beatdown. And what I didn't even know when I got there was that there is an Eagles fight song. Now, I'm not an Eagles fan. I'm a Jets fan. You know, J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. I'm a Jets fan, but the Eagles have this fight song. And when I tell you that there are 60, 70, 80,000 people screaming this fight song out, that's what it was. The Eagles score, and everybody's united. Everyone's united. It would be great if church could be a little bit more like an Eagles game. Everyone was united for the same cause. People who would never see each other in real life are sitting next to each other, high-fiving, hugging, you're the best, we're great. Nobody cares about where, everybody, where anybody else came from because they're united for the same cause. We can be united for the cause of Christ and make so much more of a difference. You ever sat, you have, have you ever sat next to a man in church who refused to sing? A man who's like, oh, I don't sing. Well, I'll tell you what, at that Eagles game, there were guys singing, singing their hearts out. <laughs> singing their hearts out. Wouldn't it be great if men came to church and sang praise to God? More so than we do now. Well, they're united for the purpose. United for the purpose, expecting to hear from God. And look at this. He read, facing the square, before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men, the women, and all who could understand, and they were attentive to the book of the law. They were attentive to what they heard. Who was there? Men, women, and all who could understand. Can your children understand God's word? Yes, absolutely. Kids understand. Now, we're not saying that they're going to Bible school, but they are understanding the principles of God's word. <coughs> Folks, the advertisers know your children can understand. That's why they market and advertise directly to them. How old are your kids when you go to the store and they see something that they've seen on TV and they want it? Because they've seen it. They've heard about it. They can see and hear about God's word just as easily, and it can be embedded in their hearts and their lives. The psalmist said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. We have the opportunity as parents, as Sunday school teachers, to implant that word in our children's hearts so that it will germinate and blossom later in their lives. Children can understand. All who could understand were there. And they were there from early morning till midday. And that leads me to a story. I hated, absolutely hated, Memorial Day and Labor Day as a child growing up. Couldn't stand them because we didn't do anything fun on Memorial Day and Labor Day. On Memorial Day and Labor Day, when everybody's <laughs> off from school and off from work, we went to church. I came from a background where we had conferences on the holidays. And the conference started when the weekend started. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, all day. Monday was the big day, because that was the holiday, all day. So we would go on Monday. So we went to church normally on Sunday, and we would go on Monday. And Monday was like this. We'd come, we'd sing one hymn, and we'd have a speaker for an hour. And then we'd have another speaker for an hour. Then we'd break for lunch. Then we'd come back, we'd have another hymn or two, speaker for an hour, and then another speaker for an hour. I got to tell you, as a five-year-old child, this was not what I wanted to do. This was not fun for me at all. Here's the best part. 
We get to school, Memorial Day, uh, the day after Memorial Day, the Tuesday. We get to school, and the teacher has us all in a little circle in kindergarten, and she wants to know what we did on our Memorial Day holiday. First kid, we had a barbecue. Wonderful. Second kid, we went to the park and had a picnic. Okay. And Stephen, what did you do? We went to the conference. And she said, what's the conference? It's like church, but all day. <laughs> and that was my experience of the conference, at least when I was a little child. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that as a five-year-old. I mean, that's one of the few memories I have from that age. But this was different. <laughs> Great memory, right? This was different. These folks gathered as one man. Now, remember, this isn't some comfortable place. There aren't cushioned seats. There's no air conditioning. This is the Middle East. 50,000 people crammed into this spot to hear God's word from early morning until noon. And this is what they're there for. And the Bible says that their ears were attentive to the words that were spoken. It wasn't just that they were there, but they were there listening attentively. How does this apply to me? What does this mean? What does this mean to me? And this is what they were there for all morning. Reading on, verse 4. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mathathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maasiah on his right hand, and Pedaiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem on his left hand. Forgive my pronunciation. All right, but here's the deal. Ezra stands on the platform. Ezra's the priest, Ezra the scribe. Ezra is the one who is presenting the word to the people. Note that it's not Nehemiah. This book is named after Nehemiah, but Nehemiah steps aside here because Nehemiah is not the priest. And this is the priest's job. So Nehemiah has come, he's taken care of everything, he's the governor, he's put the walls together, he's put civil order back in line in, line in, the, in the city. But Nehemiah steps aside, and here's Ezra. And Ezra the priest stands on a platform above the people with the word of God. The word is above the people. It's above their opinions. It's above their philosophies. It's above what society says, both, li both literally and symbolically. He stands there to speak, but Ezra does not stand alone. Whenever we look in the Bible, whenever we see the Bible, the Bible gives us a plurality in leadership. It's not a lone wolf off by himself, coming up with his own thing, doing his own thing. It's always someone who is supported by others. In the New Testament, when we read about elders, the word is always plural. It's always elders who are in charge of the New Testament church elders, a plurality of leadership. And so even though we have Ezra up here, he's not alone. He's not alone. He has other men there with him to support him and also to teach the word. And that's the example for us all. That's the example for the church today. So Ezra's there. He's on the wooden platform that's been made for this purpose. The guys who are on his right, the guys who are on his left, he opens the book he opens the book. And folks, this is the biggest thing about the church. Do they open the book? If you're in a church where they are not preaching from the scriptures, it is time to leave. It's time to go. If at any point you're here and I start giving my own opinion, if you're at any point you're here and Pastor Ken starts giving his own opinions and not opening the book, then it's time to confront us. It is time to lovingly confront us with the fact that we need to open the book. God's word stands above our opinions. It's above what we think. It's above what society says. I say, oh, it's that antiquated old book. I cannot believe you people still read that. Yes, we do. And we do so expectantly because we believe that when the book is open, that God speaks to us through it. 
and we're not only expectant, but we're attentive. We listen to God's word, finding out what it's saying to me. Because God's word goes out and it does not return void. It does what God wants it to do. It speaks to us all. You know, I was trying to come up with an example of God's word being above our opinion. And in walks Gia. Gia is seven years old. And, you know, having kids is the best theology you could ever have. Okay? Gia walks in. She's done her homework. And I'm supposed to check it. Gia is seven. She's in second grade. She hands me the paper. I look it over. I said, good job. Number six is wrong. What does Gia tell me? No, it's not. What do you mean? No, it's not. Number six is wrong. No, it's not. Are you crazy? Am I seriously arguing with a seven-year-old? I mean, I'm not a math teacher, but I can handle second grade math. This is wrong. Gia, this is not an argument. Erase your answer and do it again. All right. If my seven-year-old is arguing with me about second grade math, and it's ridiculous. How much more when we argue with God about what he's told us? If God says that marriage is between a man and a woman, but our society has decided that anybody can get married, do we go with society, or do we go with the truth of God's word? If we go with society, what we're saying is that, God, I know better than you. Now, we don't normally say that out loud, but that's what we're saying. Donovan is a complete jokester. He's our 10-year-old. Complete jokester. And he said to me the other day, he said, I self-identify as an attack helicopter. (laughs) <laughs> who are we raising right I self identify as an attack helicopter and we laughed about it and everything but then I thought about that it's like this is what society is bringing in that we self identify as whatever we want is that true is that real is it right can I just decide what I am where did that come from not from the truth of God's word. Does God's word stand above my opinion? If we are to live as believers, it must. God's word has to inform everything that we do. Every decision that we make, every opinion that we have must be in line with God's word. Otherwise, it's my seven-year-old telling me that I'm wrong. That's what we're doing. Will we put God's word above our opinion? We have the opportunity to do that every day. The people are expectant. They think that God's word is going to be spoken to them. The people are attentive. They're listening to what God's word is going to say to them. And then look at this. The people are going to be responsive. Ezra, verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabat, Hanan, Kaliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law. While the people remained in their places, they read from the book, from the book of the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Folks, you can go to seminary for years, and you'll learn about preaching. This is the essence of preaching right here, this one verse. Read from the book of the law, clearly, gave the sense so that the people understood the meaning. That's it. That's it right there. The Bible's the source. We read from it, it's clearly understood by the people, the meaning is given. That's it. It's from the Bible. It's clear to you, you understand the meaning. 
That's preaching. That's it right there, folks. And that is what they did this day. They read and they gave the understanding, and the people hear God's word, and they mourn. They mourn and weep. Look at this. Verse 9. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Why are the people weeping as they hear the words of the law? Because they realize how far away they are from what God requires. They realize that they have broken God's laws. They realize that they are sinful in comparison to a holy God. They realize that the wages of sin is death. There's no way around it. The Bible tells that the soul that sinned will surely die. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are told that if they eat of the fruit, they will surely die. And the law, the law, the Bible tells us, was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law is a mirror showing us everything that's wrong, every pimple, every blackhead, everything that's wrong. It shows it to us. The law tells us what's wrong, and we realize that the wages of sin is death. The people are mourning. The people are weeping. And Nehemiah, Ezra, and the scribes are going to tell the people not to mourn not to weep. Let's read it on. It says to them in verse 10, he says to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. What makes the change? How do they go from weeping and mourning to rejoicing and celebrating, to going to have a party, to going to give to others who do not have? What makes the change? You know what? It's interesting because it's not explicitly said here. But let's take a look at something. I'm going to read a verse to you. And Ezra, who I never spoke to, but I believe this is Ezra's life verse. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. It says, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra's been here for 13 years before Nehemiah comes. All right, Nehemiah comes, they rebuild the walls, they worked on the walls, now they're working on the people. Ezra's been here for 13 years, but Ezra, it says, he set his heart to study the law of the Lord of God, the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach it, his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra knows God's word. Ezra's been doing God's word, and Ezra's teaching God's word. Just on a side note, when we have folks that know something, but don't do it and still teach it, what do we call them? Hypocrites. We call those people hypocrites. Teaching God's word is an immense responsibility. I remember I was teaching Sunday school about a year, maybe two years ago, and we were in that portion in James where it talks about the fact that James says, not many of you should want to be teachers because we will receive the stricter or the harsher judgment. And a young lady in the class looked at me and she said, does that mean that because you teach the Bible that God is going to judge you more harshly than everyone else? I said, yes. She said, doesn't that scare you? I said, yes. <laughs> it does. And it should. Because it means that you take this responsibility seriously. Ezra set his heart to study God's word. Ezra set his heart to do it and then to teach it, because that's the order. We study it, we do it, and then we teach it. 
We know that everybody, we all know people who we call hypocrites, who study it, don't do it, but then want to teach it. We know that, and we don't appreciate that from those people. But Ezra knows God's word. And as these people come together, there's a clue that's given to us in verse 2 of chapter 8. Because the clue is the date. The date that they come together is the, sec- the first day of the seventh month. You'll see that in verse 1 and in verse 2 of chapter 8. It's the first day of the seventh month. What's the significance of the first day of the seventh month? Well, if you'd like to come along with me, come over to Leviticus chapter 23. Let's turn there. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23 and verse 23. It reads, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no ordinary work and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Today is the day of the feast of trumpets. It's a holy day to God. They fast and they blow the trumpets. And this is a day that they come to remember. Not only that, but as we read on, verse 26, the Lord said to Moses, saying, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, and you shall not do any work on that day. For it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. This was the big day of the year. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go behind the veil. This is the same veil that was ripped in two when Jesus died on the cross. This is the only day of the year that he would be able to do so. He would take an offering, he would take blood, and he would go behind the veil and go to the mercy seat to make atonement for the sin of the people. The people hear the word of the Lord. They weep. They mourn because they realize that they are sinful. The wages of sin is death. But then as they continue reading, they realize that not long from now is the day of atonement when the high priest will go in and make atonement for their sin for the year, and their sins will be covered. And then they're able to leave rejoicing. They're able to leave in the knowledge that the joy of the Lord is their strength, because God has made a way for their sins to be covered. Not only is the wages of sin death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's the beauty of it. When we read God's word with understanding, we recognize our sinfulness on one hand, but on the other hand, we see that God has made a way for us to be forgiven. Our sin is not the end of the story. Jesus dies on the cross and rips that veil from top to bottom. It's destroyed. God coming down to man, making a way to the most holy place where he himself is. And we, sinful people we are, can be reunited with God and the joy of the Lord will be our strength. What a gorgeous picture of what Jesus did for us. The day of atonement covered the people's sin for how long? One year. And the priest would have to do it again and again. But the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus went behind the veil and he sacrificed himself once for all. Jesus' sacrifice gives us the joy of the Lord. The people came. 
They came and they were expectant. They believed that God's word would be spoken to them. They believed that what was written there was the actual, literal words of God. They were expectant. The people were attentive. They were attentive to what God's word said, and they realized what it meant in their lives. They realized that they were sinful and that they were separated from this holy God. But then, the people could also be responsive, responsive to God's word that said their sins would be atoned for, their sins could be covered. How much more can we, now that Jesus has come and died, be expectant, be attentive, and be responsive to the word that he speaks to us when he speaks? It is my prayer for you, my prayer for myself, that that is how we would treat God's word as we listen to it, as we hear it, that we'd be expectant, that we'd be attentive, and that we'd be responsive to what he says to us, that our lives would be changed, and that through his spirit, we would be conformed to the image of his son. Let's stand together and close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so, so good to us, that great is your faithfulness. We are so glad, Father, that you did not leave us with the fact that the wages of sin is death. We're grateful, Lord, that you saw us in eternity past and that your son Christ made that decision to Godhead to sacrifice himself for our sin. We're so thankful, Father, that The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son. We're grateful, Lord, today that we can listen to your word, that we can hear from it, that we can learn from it. And we pray, Father, that we would not leave here in the same way that we came. May your word change us as we're both attentive and responsive to it. Help us, Father, to yield to your spirit, knowing that he wants to make us more like your Son. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.